You're listening to the Voice of Russia in London. I'm James Rinal, and we're taking a look at using economic sanctions against errant leaders. I'm joined by David Patrick Arakos, author of Nuclear Iran: The Birth of an Atomic State, Dr. Lee Jones from Queen Mary University of London, Antonius Zanakopoulos, author of Disobeying the Security Council: Countermeasures Against Wrongful Sanctions, and Over the Line from Moscow by our in-house political analyst Dmitry Babich. I want to turn to you, Dr. Jones, now about one example, which I know has been a key area of your study, which has been Myanmar. Now, on the face of it, after decades of repressive rule by a military junta, Myanmar's government has started embracing democratic reforms. Even the Nobel Peace Prize laureate Aung San Suu Kyi has been allowed back into mainstream politics. Over recent weeks, Western governments have lifted or suspended sanctions in response to these developments. My question to you is: Was it the sanctions? That forced this change to happen. I don't think there's any serious scholar of Myanmar who would draw much of a link between the two. There's quite a lot of literature that has explored the impact of sanctions on Myanmar, and it tends to draw the conclusion that it's been rather negative. I mean, Antonius is right, and he says that there are effects. It makes things more difficult to conduct international trade and finance, for example. Myanmar is a case in point. What has happened, though, is sanctions pushed Myanmar away from the West, and there was a big opening towards the West in the late 80s, early 90s. Myanmar did want to have relationships with Europe and the US, but instead it was pushed back into the arms of China and its neighbouring countries, and so most of its trade was quite quickly relocated towards those countries, and the West quite quickly became totally irrelevant in terms of the economy and the politics there. And what also it did is it forced the regime into an alliance with the various leaders of ethnic minority groups, which had engaged. Engaged in drug trafficking for many years in Burma, and these groups were co-opted into the state because they were the only ones with any capital to spend. So, if you were banning international investment, you had to get your capital from somewhere. So, it came from the drugs lords, and so now the Chamber of Industry in Myanmar reads like a who's who of the drugs trade, and that is really a quite direct impact of sanctions because there's no other options, there's no other source of trade and finance. In terms of why they've moved now, I don't think it's got very much to do with sanctions. The regime has ridden out sanctions for two decades. The real reason, I think is that part of this co-optation of the real threat to Myanmar's territorial integrity and stability has been the 50-60 year long ethnic separatist movements along the borders and gradually they've been co-opted into the post-1998 system and now there's general stability in the country so the democratic opposition could be bounced into a settlement and the military wanted to move away from direct rule to a more constitutional form of government and it announced a road map in 2003 and it's gradually pursued that road map so essentially it has been able to manage the transition there's no doubt that sanctions have affected the economy but in this case as in so many other cases there is very little link between economic pain and a political gain antonius would myanmar fit into this one third of cases where sanctions are effective. Lee raised an important point. He said sanctions imposed by the West pushed Myanmar into the hands of the East, China, whatever. Well, that's the whole point about trying to organize sanctions through the United Nations. The whole point is that all member states of the United Nations should be implementing sanctions on the basis of a decision of the Security Council. If you are going into sets of bilateral sanctions or even regional sanctions against a particular state, well, it makes absolute sense that they're going to try to relocate their trade somewhere else. So the benefit of UN sanctions in that sense is precisely that they are decided and monitored by the Security Council in order to avoid this relocation of trade. It may seem obvious that if you have more enforcement, more people participating in the sanctions regime, then it's going to be more effective. But actually, the evidence, including the study that you cite, shows that there is no relationship between the number of countries enforcing sanctions and their actual efficacy. Enforcement is always partial, even if it's a UN Security Council measure. I mean, British sanctions, which were then pushed through the UN Security Council against Rhodesia, British companies were some of the leading sanctions busters there. But there is actually no correlation between enforcement and the right outcome that you're seeking. And in fact. In cases where there's been very, very tight enforcement, there have been some disastrous outcomes. Iraq is the absolutely archetypal case. But it also in Yugoslavia, for example, in the 1990s, the tighter and tighter the sanctions were enforced, the more that the state became criminalised. It became involved in sanctions busting itself through criminal networks, and there was an overspill to neighbouring countries. And the financial collapse of Albania in the late 1990s owed a great deal to these sanctions busting networks, which pushed trade and smuggling, for example, into that country, and illicit funds built up in the banking network. So it doesn't just have this criminalising effect in the state sanctioned; it can also have it in neighbouring states too. It's extremely Stabilizing. Can I just ask, Dr. Jones, what conclusions you draw from what you're saying? I mean, obviously, sanctions have been.
been used increasingly from the 1990s onwards, and they seem to be the first choice for diplomats at the UN Security Council now. But would you argue that they are not effective and that there's no point using them? Well, David makes a very important point, which is that as an alternative to military action, military action is extremely costly and can also be extremely ineffective as a form of intervention, as we saw with Iraq. And so sanctions seem like an intermediate nice choice between doing nothing or just making diplomatic protests and invading, which is not a viable choice. So at least you can be seen to be doing something. But from my perspective, that is what it's more about. It's more about buying hawkish opinion at home or outraged liberal opinion at home, then it is about affecting real change in the world. I mean, the statistics bear that out. The one-third figure that's been cited is, as I hinted at earlier on, when it's in combination with other factors such as military force. When you take away those other factors, the third figure drops down to 4%. So it tends not to be very effective, but it's used because it's seen as you can at least express your dissatisfaction with a target regime. So it's really a kind of narcissistic measure. It's more about expressing ourselves and our disgust and our fear about the regime than it is about doing something in the target state. Antonius, is that fair? Definitely sanctions are not a panacea. They're not what you're going to use to cure the world of everything that's evil. But we need to take into consideration a number of factors. Like, for example, when you have sanctions that are effectively enforced, if the sanctions are not well targeted, if they're badly designed, they're obviously they're going to have a horrible effect. So Lee mentioned Iraq, but Iraq, in terms of the comprehensiveness of sanctions first imposed on it, that was the problem there. It wasn't The problem wasn't that they were being enforced too much or too little, but rather that they were badly designed and they were redesigned precisely for that reason. Now, when we talk about Yugoslavia, we need to bear in mind that this was an extremely fluid situation. The Security Council had just been revived after the Cold War. It was still taking its first steps in implementing sanctions, right? Rhodesia and South Africa were the first examples. After that, we've only had sanctions after the end of the Cold War. And effectively, in Yugoslavia, you had an extremely fluid situation where the, the, the state was dissolving. So it was very difficult for the Security Council to be on top of things. And and lastly, I wanted to say that the use of force is not generally used in conjunction with, with sanctions. If anything, the whole point of sanctions is precisely, as David said, not to have the use of force. So I'm not sure about whether sanctions are only effective in one third of the cases when they are accompanied by the use of force. If anything, what we saw in Iraq was that the sanctions were extremely effective because when the US and the UK went in, they didn't find all that much. And they didn't find all that much because after 13 years of specific sanctions targeting on weapons and materials used for weapons, there was effectively nothing but a couple of rifles in Iraq. And I Saddam think. Hussein was still in power, so their primary goal of sanctions had clearly not worked. It still took a military invasion to topple what was supposedly a decrepit regime. If we play a little counterfactual game, counter, some counter-history here, would Iran have returned to the, the negotiating table without the last two years of sanctions? I don't think it would have done. It's not the only tool, it's an imperfect tool, but used in conjunction with effective diplomacy and used selectively and effectively then it has worked to a degree in the Iran case, as we are seeing right now. Dimitri, can I just get you back in there? I want to get your opinion on something. Sanctions, are they just a popularity tool for Western leaders? Or, as Antonia says, they can be effective, they just need to be designed better? It depends on the situation. I think sanctions work when a goal is feasible. For example, making the white minority in South Africa to relinquish at least part of its power, it was a feasible goal, and I think sanctions helped. But for example, uh, if we want to force President Assad uh, in Syria to step down, I don't think sanctions are a tool here because, as the New York Times recently quite correctly wrote, Mr. Assad and his ever white minority face annihilation in case they lose the civil war. So I just don't understand how sanctions can force someone facing annihilation to risk his life. OK, Dr. Jones? It would be nice to think that we could increase the power of sanctions through technical measures by simply designing them better and having better institutions. But the fact is, it's not an institutional question, it's a political question. How is it that economic pain can be translated into political outcomes? What is the societal transmission belt through which sanctions must travel in order to get the outcomes that we want? And frankly, most sanctions advocates give absolutely no thought to that whatsoever. They simply think you can hit the bad guys and that will lead to outcomes that you like. 
And so, for example, leading crony capitalists in Myanmar have been repeatedly sanctioned by targeted measures. And actually, the people who get hurt by those measures are the small businessmen. The cronies always find ways around them. And that is because state society relations in target countries quite frequently allow the powerful to displace the costs, even when they're ostensibly targeted at the bad guys, onto everybody else. And quite frequently, that state society compact means that we don't have very much influence. And in the absence of a forceful democratic opposition in these countries, it's very unlikely that external intervention will be able to bring about real change. That was Dr Lee Jones from Queen Mary, University of London, arguing that economic sanctions are not only ineffective, but can also be counterproductive. I was also joined by David Patrick Harakos, author of Nuclear Iran, The Birth of an Atomic State, which is released in August. Antonius Zanakopoulos, author of Disobeying the Security Council, Countermeasures Against Wrongful Sanctions. And Dmitry Babich, our in-house political analyst over the line from Moscow. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. I'm James Rinal. Stay tuned for the latest update of what's making headlines around the world.